Hello, everyone, and welcome to another amazing episode of Immigrants Unite, when immigrants unite and transform lives. That's right. This podcast is all about helping you transform your life, your business, and the world around you. And I'm your host, Paul Spinner. Now, you may or may not be an immigrant entrepreneur or business owner, and that's perfectly fine. However, on this particular podcast, and I keep saying this every week, and I will say it again, I get to do this, and I get to dissect, strategize, and get into the minds of master immigrants who came to United States, sometimes starting from nothing, and created a successful, abundant, impactful life for themselves while actually transforming the world around them. And today I have such a guest who is literally transforming the world around her because of what he, she had to overcome in order to actually make it here. And her name is Aditi Patil. I think I got your name right, right? Did I say that right? All right, you awesome. Did. Very cool. All right, so that's a plus for me. So listen, <laughs> um, Aditi is an associate certified coach with the International Coach Federation. She's originally from Mumbai, India, and she has a decade of extensive experience in sales, marketing, and product management. And for the past five years, she's actually worked as an executive and career coach with a focus on individuals and leaders in transition. And what that exactly means is she had a long transition for herself, which was a journey that took her from India to Malaysia to Singapore and finally to United States, basically following her husband. I'll let you let her kind of dive deeper into this. And one of the last things that I want to share about her, she recently wrote a book. It's called The Ugly Duckling. And that book is about having a refreshing new take on the value of self-esteem and self-belief when it comes to just being a person. And I know she focuses a lot about immigrants and immigrant women and immigrants in total, but I think it's a really awesome, very cool children's book that talks about the ugly of story of Ugly Duckling. And I'm sure we're probably going to talk a little bit about it on this particular call. But I wanted to say hi, Adil, Aditi, and uh, welcome to the call. And tell us a little bit about the little journey that took you all the way to United States from India. Well, uh, hi, Peter. First of all, thank you so much. It is both an honor and pleasure to be on this podcast. I've listened to a couple of episodes and uh, the guests have been so inspiring. So um, I'm honored to be uh, here. Um, and uh, about my journey, I think that it's, uh, you know, when I look back at many, many immigrant journeys, I think of, you know, maybe my journey wasn't as tough as anybody else's. But I think that when I look back at my journey, uh, I grew up in India, uh, mm -hmm. spent the first uh, 35 years of my life there, never imagining that I would ever live outside uh, of the country. And it was my husband's job that took us first out of India into Malaysia. And it was a critical time because I had just actually quit my full-time job in banking to follow my passion of coaching. And a year into that business, suddenly I had to uh, be faced with this new reality that we were going to leave everything, our family, our support system, and my business and my career, and move to Malaysia. And while it was great on one hand, uh, for me, it was really challenging because suddenly from being a working mom, uh, then an entrepreneur, I became a stay-at-home parent for a while. I uh, was helping my kids adjust to the new environment. So it was almost like this whole churn and this whole questioning of this identity and grappling with this new reality uh, that uh, happened. And I think it was a turning point for me because the first six months I spent wallowing in pity and thinking I'm the victim here and I never get to do what I want to do. And why did I do all of that? But I think, uh, you know, as I moved on, I realized that in adversity or in times of difficulty, there is always an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And for me at that time in Malaysia, there was an opportunity for me to coach people. There was an opportunity for me to contribute my talent. So I started a, a, a meditation group for expatriate and immigrant women like me. And where we would come together every month and discuss a certain topic like 
powerful thinking or meditation or uh, you know how do you reimagine your career in a new world and i think these groups gave me as much as i gave those groups so so that really was a turning point for me where i realized that no matter what country i was in no matter what was left of my identity i could always build over and start over again um and then of course we are i thought our moves would end in malaysia we would spend a while and we would go back to india but that didn't happen mm-hmm. we ended up moving to singapore that was a very short pit stop i continued doing a lot of coaching i worked with the united nations high commission of refugees doing programs for women uh, leaders there and then we moved to the us and we landed first in uh, wisconsin and i think that was again a whole new world uh, and by then i was really excited about the opportunities that uh, presented itself to me so when i moved to wisconsin again it was great because i went out i met a lot of people who were so receptive to me and my talents and i was able to land a job in a, a healthcare company where i was working with their leaders mm-hmm. um doing leadership development and training programs and so on and i think that was i was entrenched in the community there uh, i used to write for the post uh, crescent i became very involved in the community in just a matter of uh, a year and we spent about 2 years there and uh, then it came another uh, move which was unexpected so we moved to the seattle area last year and that was hard because suddenly i was plucked from this great job that i like to an unfamiliar environment and i i found myself back into that victim mode which i was in malaysia mm-hmm. saying why do i have to do this why do i have to start a fresh every single time um and i think it took me 6 months to realize that i could draw on the same lessons and that's when i decided that one common theme for me has been coaching and working with women in transition so i totally took this opportunity to re kind of reinvent myself in this new place and uh, i now work with women who are relocating to the seattle area some of them are immigrants some of them are not but they have one thing in common they have been stripped of their identity they don't have a job they're coming to a new area without any support system and i work with them to help them make sense of the move to be confident that they too can figure out their own path despite the change and despite the chaos that's happening around them All right so listen that's one hell of a journey that you have going on there that you had i mean and one just one thing out of this journey coming from india or singapore or malaysia i end up in wisconsin <laughs> that's a little bit of a different weather there that's first of all but i mean the culture shock and then south it's probably a little bit different i know there was some uh, community that you kind of work with there and then in seattle you know coming into a whole another culture and another weather kind of thing so here is what i was hearing and i think a lot of immigrants deal with that because not only do you come in a different culture some of them don't speak english right or they have that you know kind of obstacle to overcome and a lot of it i think has to do with mindset and i talk about mindset on this podcast all the time because i think it is so important when it comes to um living the life that you want to live whether you're in malaysia or singapore seattle wisconsin michigan wherever right and whether you're an immigrant or not so a couple of things that i've heard from you is there is basically two different types of mindsets that you had you experience yourself right one of them was good the other one not so good so elaborate a little bit about those yeah absolutely and you're absolutely right it is about mindset our brain is a powerful tool and it focuses where we want it to focus so if we decide to focus on all the negative things our brain will find a way to focus and figure out 10000 negative things that are not there mm-hmm. but on the same hand if we decide to choose on the positive things uh, our brain will look for all those things so i think the two mindsets that i have seen in myself and of course when i work with clients i think one of them is is very comfortable it's called i call it the victim mindset it's very comfortable to be there because then you are 
passive. You're saying, this is not my fault. I was put into this situation. Uh, I don't like it, uh, you know, and you kind of just stew over there. And I, I think sometimes we get comfortable with our misery. It's like this little blanket that we put on ourselves. It makes us feel warm. We don't have to do anything about it. So I think it's good for a while. Uh, but if we stay there longer, we it, it doesn't allow us to move into action. Mm-hmm. Um, it doesn't allow us to do anything, really. So we remain stuck. Uh, and I, and I always ask myself in my tough moments, I always ask myself, like, what mindset am I in? Am I being, am I choosing to be a victim here? Because that is a choice. We, we make that choice to stay in that victim mindset. So let me ask you this. You kept, and listen, I agree with this because I coach clients all the time. And I do believe it's a choice, right? That we make, we choose how we focus we basically focus where we want to focus, that kind of stuff. I know that there are a lot of people who, there are some people out there who feel like they don't really have a choice. It's just how it is for them. Like, it's, I don't have a choice, like, especially for someone who has the victim mentality, right? Mm-hmm. So how would you talk to them? How would you describe that, like, this is a choice? How would you have them overcome that? You know, there's a story, it's a blog post that I wrote. Uh, my kids are uh, 12 and 6 and they love superhero movies. Mm-hmm. So we went to see this movie called Thor from Ragnarok. Yep. Now in the movie, Thor basically, Thor is the god of thunder, but his power lies in his hammer. Mm-hmm. So in this movie, his hammer basically is broken and taken away. So he spends a lot of time in that movie thinking that he doesn't have those powers because his hammer is not there. Right. So I think we feel that that hammer can represent many things in life to us, that it's my job that's gone away. It's, and therefore I don't have anything. And Mm -hmm. that's why I kind of choose to be in this victim mode. Like this happened to me. Uh, But then there comes a turning point where Thor's father reminds him, are you the God of the hammer or are you the God of thunder? So, you know, you, you remind yourself that, does this job or does this situation really define who I am? What was taken away from me or what I have, I have lost or what I don't have? Is this really a who I am? And in most times, the answer is no. You are, you, you are a person of different talents. You have something to give uh, to the world. So I think that just taking a step back um, and thinking about, uh, okay, this happened to me. I didn't have a choice then, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe I didn't have a choice at that time when this choice was happening. This happened to me. Absolutely. There is no denying it. But then thinking about, okay, now what? Um, What is it that I can lean on about myself that is different from all the things that I've I've accumulated? Right. Just reminding yourself of that big picture um, of what you want to do. Exactly. So one thing that I heard you say, and let me make sure I understand, is that this is a really powerful concept for you guys to grasp, is that when it comes to identity, right? Because we mentioned identity on this call a little bit, and I've mentioned it in previous podcasts as well, is the one that a lot of times the identity that doesn't work or it causes to have that you know, victim mentality, whatever, is the identity that's attached to the external environment, to something that you don't really have control over. And I mean, outside of your own emotions, you really don't have any control, you know, of how life happens or all the kind of things, right? So identity that's tied in to a, like, I am a, you know, a teacher or whatever in Singapore or I, you know, into that environment, right? When that gets taken away, right, because you have to move to a different country, now that identity gets taken away as well because it stays there, right? However, if you shift your thinking, your focus on identity, the one that you can control kind of thing, as who you are as a person, that stays with you, right? Because it can go from one place to another. And then you don't really lose that identity. You keep, You can take it to any kind of place in the world and use it in a brand new environment to empower you and, and keep you going. Am I hearing you right? 
Absolutely. That's a great way uh, to put it. You know, we, we put our identity, especially women. We are moms, we are wives, we are support system, we have a career, and then we tend to put all of that. And I think what has been a great grounding factor for me to come back to the identity has been my why. Um, so my why, when I think of what's what's my why, I have a why statement and it's mm -hmm. that I want to make a meaningful difference to people so that they can create their own path with greater self-belief. So every time I have been stripped of my identity or I felt like, oh, I've lost this job. Now I've come to a new area. I just go back and think about what's my why uh, and how can I find a way to live my why rather than focus on looking for a job or a business or, or something. So I would say just going deeper to obviously, you know, uncovering what is your why mm -hmm. uh, and, and using that as an anchor and as a grounding force to, to, and that in itself, I think will help you move out of that victim mindset. Because when you look at the empowering statement, your why is usually an empowering statement or a mission statement. Once you read it, you know, and you keep reading it, it's, it's, it, it's a little difficult to stay a victim when you can look at your why and say, oh, wow, I, that's why I want to get up every morning and do what I do. Right, exactly. You know, and I, this is one of those things that I do with every single one of my clients. I help them develop their why. Because the why is your driver. It's the thing that pushes you. It's the thing that gets you up five in the morning. If you are, let's say, you know, you want to be working out in the morning, right? When you open your eyes because the clock, you know, the alarm clock goes off at five in the morning and you're still tired and that why pops into your head, that's the thing that's going to get your feet to get out of the bed, hit the floor and start going working out, right? So it's really important and, and that's going to help you um, transition your focus from that belief or that mentality that's not impactful. It's not helping you. It's not serving you. But here's the thing. Sometimes the victim mentality does serve someone, right? It keeps them in this comfort zone, right? As much as they don't like it, maybe sometimes they don't even realize it, that they do like it, right? That there are a victim mentality, right? So one first thing is to actually recognize that, that mm -hmm. that's there. It's not helping. It's not empowering you, right? And I think for, uh, you know, for immigrants, that's especially important because, when you come to a brand new environment like you did, uh, and you know, did you speak English? You did speak English, right? When you came here, yes, yes, right. so I did. So that was a little bit easier. Absolutely, yeah. But I do work with a lot of women who who they speak English, but you know, they do struggle with some fluency. And I think that that's that does take um, that is a challenge for them, and that that also has an impact on self esteem. All right. All right. Let's talk about that for a minute. Self-esteem, because you talked about the book, right? The Ugly Duckling that talks about self-esteem, confidence and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. So how do you help with that? Yeah. So, you know, I feel like the victim mindset is also tied in somewhere with self-esteem. You know, we are all struggling. I think at some level, all of us struggle with our self-image and that is heightened when we move into a new place. Mm -hmm. Because we we may fit in, some people just fit in, you know, they have an innate sense of confidence. But sometimes you just feel like you don't belong. You feel like the odd person out. You are the new person. And, you know, you have to put yourself out there. And it's it's not, it's uncomfortable to be the new person. Uh, yep. You know, my 12-year-old my said, Mom, for the last three years, I've been the new person, new kid in the school on the first day. Do you know how much that sucks? <laughs> And I right. said, yeah, I hear you. So, so being the new person uh, in any place has an impact on self-esteem. And we don't recognize it. Like you said, we, just, we don't even recognize that we are in the victim mindset. So I think it's, it's, you've got to be aware that what am I thinking about myself when I look in the mirror? Am I telling myself I don't belong in this place or I don't have what it takes to succeed in, the, in this place? 
Uh, and then there are people around you who might feed into that or encourage a different view. So I always, you know, I remember when I was, when I moved to the US, I was meeting a lot of people in Wisconsin and I met someone and he basically ripped apart my profile and, uh, you know, said that I would never get a job here until I really understood the environment and I had to spend two or three years, you know, really understanding. And and that was a big blow to my self-esteem. So, mm-hmm. you know, we have to be mindful that we can also struggle with our own self-image, but there are also other people who might say things to us, which can mess with our self-esteem. So for me, I realized that every time I moved, I went through this questioning, like, do I belong here? And it's almost like that old ugly duckling story where the ugly duckling is abandoned because she was gray. And then she goes to every family and says, are you my family? And are you my family? So, and then ultimately she becomes a swan. So when I read that story, I felt like, why does she have to become this swan? You know, that's the ideal identity, right? Right. Why? Why do we have to become a swan? I don't want to become a swan. So I think that um, also in my work as a coach, I've I've trained in the work of Louise Hay, where uh, we teach a lot of mirror work and accepting yourself in the mirror. So that's why I called my book, The True Story of the Ugly Duckling. And in my book, the ugly duckling does not become a swan, spoiler alert. (laughs) But, uh, you know, it's really about... Yes, people will reject you. People will, not all people will accept you. Um, You might not accept yourself in the beginning, but that is the key to be able to look into the mirror and say, you know what? I love you. I accept you as I am right now. And I'm willing to work um, to become the person I want to be. So I think the starting point of self-esteem is really accepting yourself for who you are and then letting go of this ideal of a beautiful swan. Now, a swan might be a metaphor for anything, right? It might be like, oh, I need to have this ideal job. Oh, I need to have, my kids need to be a certain way or um, I need to have this business. And, you know, that's the ideal that we are chasing. But really, what's what we have to do is first, first accept ourselves. And that is the building block of self-esteem. And that's what I wanted to talk about and mainly to children as well. But like somebody said about my book, that it's, it's, a, it's a children's book actually designed for adults. So adults have also enjoyed my book because it tells the story of this ugly duckling. And believe me, we've all been ugly ducklings at some point of time. Right. I've been there. I've been I've been there many times. Every time I move, I feel like, oh my God, I'm this ugly duckling. Um, and then I have to just love myself, be myself, celebrate myself, and you know, uh, move on and create my own path and be whoever I want to be. And if I want to be a swan, that's okay. But I don't have to be a swan. That's my message. Right. Awesome. I love that message because I think one of the things is, you know. One thing that I think a lot of them, this is what I came here with too when I was younger, with the whole American dream, right? And there is this perfect picture of what this American dream looks like. And it's just uh, one example of how sometimes we start to live towards this perfect picture of what the life looks like. And we ended up getting stressed. We ended up getting uh, tired and overworked and there is no work-life balance. And most of the time, the people who suffer is you yourself and the family, the people and the most important people around you because you constantly keep going after that, right? And and I think that is important kind of a lesson to get that it doesn't have to be that way. There is no such thing as this swan, you know, or perfect, you know what I mean? And so it's I really love that you did that. Now, the other thing is that I heard you say is, about the self-esteem and you know it doesn't have to be just with coming into this country it has to do with any particular situation that you go out into the world you go into a new meeting a networking meeting you're the new person there or you go into a business meeting or you go into uh you know meeting somebody in a street or, or a date right or you're looking to go and 
um, talk to a girl in a, in a bar or whatever, right? It could be as little as things like that. And one of the things that it gives, there's the hit that happens on your self-esteem when you're starting to focus on yourself, you're starting that conversation in your head of something bad, like mm. something negative about yourself, right? And yes. that's when that starts and that's where the self-esteem starts to get hit. And transforming that, shifting that into outside of yourself. And one of the things that I tell my clients is that, listen, do you think you're the only person who has these kinds of conversations happening? Consider that if you go to a, let's say, a business meeting or networking meeting and there's 100 people in there, Every one of these people have these kinds of conversations going on in their head, right? I can't come up to this person because of this, because of that, or whatever. I can't talk to this person, right? Because I'm not good enough, or I'm not smart enough, or whatever it might be, right? We put these labels on ourselves, right? And we kind of mentioned this before the call. So talk a little bit about the labels, because I think this is really important for the listeners to get, and uh, how these labels are actually not permanent either. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you know, I've, I've, uh, my first experience with labels was when I came to the US and I was actually meeting my career coach. And he was wonderful. I mean, he was the reason I found my first job and he made me feel so confident. But one thing he said to me is, he said, you are a trailing spouse. And that was the first time I'd ever heard that word. And I went home and I Googled it and I said, and that the, the trailing spouse definition is obviously somebody who's trailing, right? Who's mm -hmm. following. So to me, it was very passive. And I was like, oh my God, I'm not passive, <laughs> you know? Um, so so trailing spouse is basically somebody who follows uh, his or her husband or wife uh, as they move jobs. So I think first I was really uh, appalled at that label. Mm -hmm. I said, oh my God, I'm not uh, following my husband passively for my job. And so it started with this whole uh, questioning. And then it was like, wait a minute, I totally am. <laughs> you know, he's been moving and I've been following. So I think it was this reality check to say, oh, I'm sorry, that label doesn't apply to me to saying, oh, you know what? I think somewhere it does. And then I, I said, you know what? I'm not going to let that define me. And let me say... I'm not a trailing spouse, but I'm like this trailblazing spouse. I'm going to blaze this new trail. I'm going to, you know, do my own thing. And um, after a while, I think that got really exhausting. Like you said, this pursuit of this ideal job or these external things. I was, uh, I, I got tired of blazing a new trail, you know. Uh, mm. I, I didn't want to have that pressure on myself. It's, it started feeling um, like I was putting a lot of pressure on myself. Mm -hmm. And that's when I said, you know what, um, Yes, I am, a, I am a spouse who has relocated because of my husband's job. There's no denying that reality. Mm -hmm. It has opened me up to many, many amazing experiences. And I have grown in ways that I never would have grown. And I said, you know what? I'm not a trailing spouse. I'm not a trailblazing spouse. I'm just a marvelous spouse. And, you know, I'm just wonderful as I am. I don't need to do anything to... Uh, blaze a new trail. I don't need to do anything to uh, be kind of celebrated. I'm celebrated for just who I am. You know, I walked away from my support system to support my husband's career. Wow, like that's I'm I'm celebrated for just that. So I think you know, just taking that those labels and saying you know I'm I'm marvelous as I am. Uh, so I I started just recently started blogging as the marvelous spouse where I just blog about my daily um, life and you know what it takes to be a spouse who is relocating because of the husband or uh, uh, husband's career. So I mean I I like labels uh, as long as they as as long as they don't put you in a box, mm -hmm. um, you know because we all know that everything in life that's worth living happens outside of the box. So, uh, you know, for me, that's where I've, with this marvelous spouse, I've put myself out of the box and saying, I'm just marvelous who I am. And I am a spouse. So <laughs> you're a marvelous spouse. Yeah. <laughs> so listen, here is what I'm hearing. 
guys, uh, and this is really cool because of the fact that one thing that I heard you say is it's really important to know yourself, who you really are as a person, right? And once you get to know yourself as a person, who you really are, and what I mean by that is, you know, it's not something that is disempowering you. Like, I'm not smart enough because a teacher in your seventh grade told you that you're too dumb to be in this grade, Johnny, or whatever, right? Or somebody, as you were growing up, said that you're not smart enough because you can't figure this thing out or you can't do this or you can't do that, right? So I'm not talking about this. I'm looking at who you really are as a person that's going to help you as a person to live in this world, right? Once you know that, right, just be with that. You know, like a lot of it, I think, has to do with just being in kind of living in a moment. Because if we are, you know, living in the past, which a lot of the victim mentality happens in that, right? Because I don't have this or I don't have that, or I was in Singapore and I'm not there, or I was in Malaysia, I had this, and I'm not there, right? Or, you know, going after the swan like identity, that can be very exhausting as well, right? Mm-hmm. However, if you just, be a lot of times, create yourself who you are as a person and being in that moment and living life that way, it becomes a lot more empowering. It becomes a lot more, uh, you become a lot more confident. Your Mm -hmm. self-esteem goes up and you can live the life that actually supports other people and live that why that, for instance, like you, living your why. Am I right on that path? Absolutely. Yeah, bang on. That's that's really well put. Uh, And, you know, just going back to something that you said resonated with me earlier was this whole negative self-talk that gets in the way of Mm -hmm. this. Um, So I think of it like there's this voice in your head, which is really amplified because we've allowed that negative self-talk voice to be amplified over the years. And then you start with a little seed of a positive voice. And a lot of my clients tell me, oh, I'm trying to do some positive self-talk but it's not working. And I'm like, well, that's at a volume level of one and your negative self-talk is a volume level of hundred. <laughs> so right. how's it going to work? So I think you just got to up, keep upping the level of your positive self-talk and keep decreasing the volume level of your negative self-talk. And that's going to pull, like you said, you know, pull you out of there. Yeah. Pull you out. And, and then be quiet enough to really understand who you are, right? Like you said, we, you know, how do we understand who we are when there is when there is quiet space in our uh, brains? If our brains are filled with negative self-talk, there's going to be no quiet space to think about who we are. All right, very cool. Awesome. Listen, I want you to give us some tips uh, because let's say there are some women out here who are immigrants or who are women who are, like you said, in a way, the trailing spouse, right? Or someone who is in that kind of a situation. What could you tell them? What would kind of tips or strategies would you give them? Because sure. I think you've um, done something along those lines, haven't you? You've yeah, been there? <laughs> yes, absolutely. And you know, it's funny, I always shy away from giving advice. But uh, I guess what I would say is, you know, it is hard. It is super hard to leave your support system and then move to somewhere else to support your spouse's career and take care of the family. So I would, I would say to the women who are doing this like me, it is really hard. And so first of all, hats off to you. If you're Mm -hmm. done this, or if you are a trailing spouse, I think that's the first thing I would say to them. And second is so, so I think that's where you start with acknowledging yourself for what you've done and for how hard this is and for how brave you are. So I guess my tip then is just acknowledge yourself for being brave and courageous. And then second is um, just be yourself. And, you know, don't, like you said, don't get stuck on this, this whole swan. People will tell you, oh, you're meant to do this. Or people will tell you, this is how it's done you know, drown out all those voices and just focus on what you want to contribute uh, to yourself, to your family, and then to the world around. Um, I think that that's, that contribution is, is really important, like to focus on 
what can I do today? Because the place that, and this was a realization for me, Peter, is that when I left Wisconsin and I came here and I was pining for all that I left behind and I, and I woke and I said to myself, that place which I left does not exist anymore. It's gone. Mm -hmm. Even if I go back right now, it's not going to be the same. Right. And then, this place that I am in is not created anymore because there's nothing here. So I am in between. And wow, what a powerful point of creation this is to be able to create my new story. So I think looking at every new opportunity or moving to a place as a point of creation, as a point of transformation to say, not like, oh, I can't do anything, but wow. Look at all the things that I can do. I think just, just that shifts that lens. So I wake up thinking, wow, you know, my life is kind of like a blank slate right now. I, you know, I look at all the things I could do. Right. I love that. You know, and that's really cool that you mentioned that. I love that uh, you said that, you know, if I went back to Wisconsin, that place where I was at doesn't exist anymore. And that is a really good view on life because it allows you to break away from that past, break away from that, you know, maybe victim mentality or whatever the case may be, right? Because that doesn't exist anymore. And I kind of got a taste of that too when I was uh, four years ago when I went back to Poland. My uncle passed away and went over there for a funeral. And, but I loved my childhood there in Poland. I was there up to 14 years old. And there was a period of my life where between 8 and 14 years where I lived in that small village with my aunt, my uncle, and I just loved how the kids were and how we were playing outside and doing all those kinds of crazy things, right? And that was one of those things that kind of pulled me back to go back there, you know? And I went back there four years ago, and that place didn't exist, yeah. you know? That wasn't there anymore the way it was back then. And it gave me this sense of like, you know what, I love, I mean, I love what I'm doing right now. You know what I mean? I love where I'm at. I love what I do. But it gave me this kind of a sense of like, well, that place doesn't exist anymore. So I think for people to get that for themselves, because it doesn't exist, really, even if you think about it, what you had five minutes ago doesn't exist anymore, right? You're in a present moment. And then shifting that thinking into I can be the creator for the next moment, right? For the next uh, area, my next journey in my life gives you so much power to actually go and rock this thing out. And that is so cool. So I just want to acknowledge you for you creating that new way, you know, for the women here that are coming with spouses and you're helping them because this is really cool. We need people like you in this world. And it's so amazing that you are doing that for other people. And, uh, and trailblazing, in a way, this <laughs> kind of uh, new path, you know what I mean? So that's very cool. So listen, I want to respect your time and the time of the listeners here. So I want to go into my Polish Peter's final round. Mm -hmm. And my first question is, so what book would you recommend? And I hope that one of those books is The Ugly Duckling Story. But <laughs> what are the other books would you recommend? Yeah, so I, I'm going to take that shameless plug and say, yes, my book is called The True Story of the Ugly Duckling. Um, it's filled with colorful images and it's available on Amazon. So uh, it's a great book to read with your kids or even for adults. Uh, uh, so apart from that, I think I recently read uh, two books as my Christmas gift to myself. Mm -hmm. uh, so the first one was Becoming by Michelle Obama. And uh, while she is not exactly a trailing spouse, she did relocate to the White House because of her husband. Uh, I really liked her journey. And I think, you know, she, how she had to make these swerves in her career and how she had to change her identity and how beautifully and how much with dignity she did that. So mm -hmm. when I looked at her life, it made me feel like, wow, that is inspirational. And it's, it's really a, a thick book, but... I found myself reading it every night without fail. Wow. And I finished it in like five or six days. So I loved it. And there are two messages in it that are very tied to what we were speaking about. And one is that I am enough. And yeah. two, that I have a voice. 
That is very cool. Okay. And that was, did you say there was two books? Or just oh, two? yes. The other one uh, that uh, I was reading is uh, Dare to Lead by Brene Brown. Um, yep, you know, there's a great book. That's a wonderful book. I'm a big fan of, and, and really understanding how shame and vulnerability uh, play a part in our lives. So that's another one that I just finished reading. All right. Very cool. Awesome. Okay. One piece of advice. I mean, you shared a lot of good stuff on this podcast. I mean, love the mindset shifts and, and the little nuggets about how you look at life and shifting from them, you know, victim mentality to more empowering mindset and all that kind of stuff trailblazing how you shifted your own thinking into you know creating the new life for yourself and, and the new journey and the why having the why and all that kind of stuff lots of good stuff if there was one last piece of advice to put in like a little bow tie for an immigrant mm-hmm. listener what would it be wow that's a tough one <laughs> um can i say that you know Take advice from a lot of people, obviously, but just do your own thing. <laughs> you know, um, don't take don't take any advice from me because my journey is different and your journey is different. So I guess what I'm saying, what I'm trying to say is, um, you can listen to many many inspirational stories and be inspired, but ultimately mm-hmm. your journey is yours and yours alone. So. Just go for it and go for what is feels true to you. Right. Um, you know, that that's what I would say. Right. Be authentic to yourself, right? Take advice from people, right? Because especially mm-hmm. the people in business, we talk about modeling successful people, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So you, you want to model some of these successful people and look at what they've done to get to where you're kind of looking to go. But be authentic with yourself. Be you. Don't try to be somebody else. And Absolutely. I think that's your message that you're kind of talking about, you know, because I Absolutely. think that's going to help you so much. All right. Next question. One thing that you would want to share about the old country, in your case, it would be India. Or, I mean, you can pick any of them, right? That you would, <laughs> I think in your case, that one thing you want to share, uh, whether it's food, custom, saying, place, anything. Yeah, so it's interesting. And I always, whenever I have people over to my house. So one thing about India is that whenever you visit any Indian household, even if it, it, it's for 10 minutes, you'll always be fed. There'll always be some food <laughs> or drink offered to you. And the reason is because there is a saying called Atiti, not, not to be confused with my name, mm-hmm. but Atiti Devo Bhava. Now, what this means is that our guests are like God. Really? So, yeah. So when somebody comes into a house, they are our guests and they are like gods. So, uh, and in India, we feed our gods a lot of good food. So, you know, that's why whenever you come to any good Indian household, you'll always be fed something. <laughs> and, you know, it's almost, um, it's almost insulting for the host if you say, no, 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 I'm not going to, I don't want to eat anything. And then sometimes they'll say, okay, if you're in a hurry, here, take a little bit of sugar. Um, you know, because you should, you should not leave my house without eating anything. So uh, I always joke when we have people over for dinner who are Americans and they are sometimes very shy about taking second helpings. I always tell them, look, if you don't take second helpings, that means you didn't like my food. So, <laughs> okay, so but, yeah. I never knew that. That's a really good, I mean, that's a really good perspective because it gives me like, you know, that is, I can see why it can be insulting, right? I mean, you're viewing me as like a god, you know, coming in, <laughs> like you want to feed, which is funny because when I was little, my aunt, you know, when somebody would come over, she would always have something on the table, right? Usually it was some like coffee, tea, maybe little cookies, maybe little desserts, little things, right? And it was just reserved for them. Like we oh. couldn't touch any of that stuff. <laughs> so we had to kind of like go around and try to find the key to that pantry that she had, you know, locked up to all this kind of stuff. But uh, but your reason is a lot more uh, impactful than obviously hers. But it's, it's a really good thing. I, I don't know about that. Okay, next question. I believe that every single person in the world has a superpower. What is yours? Wow. So um, I don't know about superpower, but it's something that I have really relied on. Um, it's it's one of my values as well. It's resilience. 
Uh, and I think it's something that all immigrants also have to mm. rely on because you come in, you start with nothing. And resilience is the ability to come back to your original shape or form after you've been, you know, kind of from zero. So I think that that resilience, that aspect that I can I can face failure and I can go down in the depths of despair or and mm. have nothing, but I can still claw my way back up and become who I want to be. So I think that resilience is something that I model in myself, in my family, with my kids. We talk a lot about uh, resilience. And, um, you know, having started over four times in the last five years, I feel like um, I may be relying too much on it. <laughs> but yeah, that's that's kind of my superpower, if you call it. Yeah, you don't think it's a superpower? Come on. <laughs> Uh, it, seriously, that kind of resilience, it, it takes something because, listen, like you said before, um, there is a choice that we always have, right? And how we want to handle the situation, how we want to live, how we want to interact, how we want to be. And that is a choice because you can totally crumble and just give up and not have to deal with anything and be that victim. Or you can keep moving and doing what you're doing right now. You know, inspiring women, helping women and transform their lives and helping them live that inspired life in a, in a new culture, in a new way. So that is a superpower. Trust me. I, I, I totally believe that. And that is freaking awesome. So, all right. Thank you. My last question for you is, how could somebody reach out to you if they wanted to find out more or, or maybe there is women on the call that they want to get some coaching from you or how would they go about yeah. doing that? Yeah, so a couple of ways. I have a website, uh, pateladithi.com. Um, and that's where I write and you can subscribe to updates and read my blog. Um, I can They can also connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn as Aditi Patil. Um, and then I have my email, which is patil.aditi at gmail.com. Um, so all of these three ways. I'm constantly meeting women in the community for coffee or connecting with people just to understand and listen to their story and share mine. So uh, even if, if you want coaching, that's great. But even if you don't want coaching, you just want to talk um, and share stories. I'm open to that as well. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you. I'm going to put this in the show notes if that's okay with you. Absolutely. All right. Very cool. So listen, thank you so much for sharing your life, for sharing your success or your failures and being vulnerable on this call. I think it's that's one of the things that I think is important for people is to not only be vulnerable with themselves, with other people too, because it allows you to, allows people to see who you really are and allows you yourself to see who you really are. And so thank you so much for being vulnerable. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I appreciate <laughs> you for who you are. Seriously, I, I love that I got to do this podcast interview with you because I've gotten to uh, see an amazing woman here that's not only resilient, that is actually creating something new for, um, I think that's a much needed thing in this community for any woman, really, not just for, and, and hats off to you because I, I, if I was a woman, I don't think I could do it to what you guys have to do and are capable of doing as a woman. So thank you so much for you listeners. Thank you guys for being here. As always, I appreciate you. I love the fact that you guys are listening to my podcast because without you, I wouldn't be able to have this podcast. Now, if you want to be a guest or you know somebody who would be a great guest, head over to mastersunite.com. I have all these episodes on there, plus many more. At this recording, I have over 50 of them. And, you know, share your story on there. Let me know. Um, send me an email at peter at mastersunite.com and let me know about your story. I would love to hear your story as well. Now, with that said, um, I hope you guys to see you guys on the next episode of Masters Unite. And until then, this is Polish Peter out. <laughs>